Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're talking with Sachin Panda. He is a leading expert in the field of circadian rhythm research. He's a professor at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies and a founding executive member of the Center for Circadian Biology and the University of California in San Diego. Sachin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, so it, we're talking about your book, The Circadian Code. Um, what what inspired you to put this book together? Well, the new field of circadian rhythm um, truly studies health because unlike any other branch of biomedical research that studies disease, this really studies health. And I've been working in this field for 22 years, and uh, we have been seeing so many progress that directly relates to human life and can make an impact right now. And there was no such book uh, on circadian rhythm that puts together how light, how circadian clock, or eating, fasting cycle affects health. So I thought um, this would be a disservice not to write a book for the general public to know about this um, field of study and use some information right now. Yeah, and I, I like what you said about studying health rather than disease. I mean, to me, um, being you know healthy and preventative is to prevent a disease from happening. But I know in in conventional medicine, prevention is preventing the disease from getting worse. And I, I just don't know why we would w- even want to get that far into a disease um, if there's something that we can do about it. Yeah, so uh, that's why again and again we see in uh, laboratory that uh, by using very simple lifestyle changes, we can completely prevent or even in many cases uh, delay the onset of unavoidable disease by several uh, months in animals and maybe in years in humans. So that's why I thought uh, this is very important because we should remember that um, prevention is the best medicine and prevention is also uh, economically more sound because living with a chronic disease these days, whether it's diabetes, um, extreme obesity, cardiovascular disease, uh, the cost of living with this disease is around two to $5,000 a year. And people live with this disease for 10, 20 years. So that means by just delaying or avoiding the disease, you are making a huge saving that can go into uh, investing in our future or next generation. So, um, what exactly is the circadian rhythm? Um, so circadian, the name circadian comes from two Latin words that uh, mean 24 hours. Uh, so that means our body has many rhythms that, many things that repeat in every 24 hours. Almost every hormone in our body, every neurotransmitter or brain chemicals, every enzyme, digestive juice, even every gene in our genome uh, turn on and off at a certain time of the day. The reason we have these circadian rhythms is because almost all living organisms on our planet have been living um, with these predictable changes in day and night every single day. And with the change in day and night, there is change in light, temperature, humidity, food availability, predator threat, um, almost everything and that we experience changes. So that's why um, all animals, plants, and humans have these circadian rhythms almost ingrained in our DNA. And these are important because um, experimentally we have seen that even if you take any animal, any um, plant, or even humans and put us in a light-dark cycle or day-night cycle that's not exactly 24 hours, but say 23 hours or 20 hours or 18 hours or 25 hours, then we cannot perform well. And even some plants and animals may not even reproduce well. So that's why these are extremely important that things happen at the right time. 
And if we want to make a simple analogy, it's almost like looking at any office building where, or a school where there are certain time when the bell rings in school, and before the bell rings, the custodian staff come in and clean up the place. So kids come in, then they have specific period, very, very various classes, they go through that. At the end of the day, then there might be some uh, office hours for um, some students, and then they go to their physical ed or play, then go home. Everything happens at clockwork precision. And just imagine if kids come to school at random time, or they go to random period, or the teachers don't show up. So um, you can imagine that even though you have the same uh, event happening, same function happening in the school, if they don't happen at the right time, then learning will go down, chaos will prevail. So that's exactly what happens when our rhythms inside our body get disrupted, um, our health is severely impacted. Well, one thing I I um, found fascinating in your book was that you found um, that there's actually genetic codes inside our, our organs that, that they're stimulated at different times to do different things. And it just seems like this beautiful symphony happening in our body taking care of us that we know nothing about. Yeah, exactly. So um, many years ago, almost two to three decades ago, people thought, well, the circadian rhythm may be just a small part of our health digest tells us when to sleep and when to wake up, and it might have affect only a small part of the brain. But almost uh, 18, 19 years ago when the genomes were sequenced and it became easier to look at um, how genes are turned on and off, we started doing experiments starting with the brain and we said, yes, uh, there are nearly 5 to 10 percent of the genes turned on and off in a small part of the brain that we knew. Uh, was tightly linked to circadian rhythm. But there are two major um, advances in the field, I think, that have profound impact for health. Uh, One is the discovery that almost every cell in our body has a clock. So that means every cell knows when to, um, I think (laughs) it'll be too much extrapolation, but I'll still use every cell actually sleeps and wakes up. So that means it does its work at a certain time and then has to rest, repair, and rejuvenate at another time. And then when people peer into uh, why this is happening, they found that uh, just like in the brain, five to, small part of the brain called suprachiasmatic nucleus, 5 to 10% of genes rise and fall at different times, every cell has its own subset of genes that turn on and off at different times. And if we combine this, and we find our genome is programmed to turn on and off at a certain time in at least one organ. Uh, so that means uh, it's a big symphony that's going on inside our body. It's so complex that it will take decades to figure out um, exactly how these are connected. But right now, the take-home message is, yes, there is this extreme complex symphony that goes on. And if there is some disturbances to it, then the specific tissue or organ fails to do its job. And if it continues, then we get closer to chronic disease. So, um, you know, you're saying that this can lead to to chronic disease. Um, This, I mean, there's not a lot of people I find that are actually following a rhythm. People stay up late or they have to get up early for work or they're, you know, there's definitely people aren't getting enough sleep and they might not be eating properly. Um, And... And so what you're saying is that even not following this this rhythm, this code, is, is leading us down that path into illness. Yeah. So although we have been living with these rhythms for thousands of years, uh, it's ingrained in our DNA, we just learned about these rhythms right now, <laughs> only in the last decade or so. So that means all these years, uh, over the last 150 or 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, um, we have ignored these rhythms and uh, built our lifestyle, our work, our commute, uh, how we light up our house, um, how we schedule shift work, or how do we time, what time kids go to, should go to school. All of this, every day-to-day activity has been designed, uh, has been adopted without knowing the impact of disrupting our circadian rhythm. 
So we're just waking up to the impact of circadian rhythm. So then the question is, well, if it is so important and if almost all of us can relate that we have gone through some circadian disruption, sleeping late into the night or eating at the wrong time or doing shift work or taking care of some loved ones, uh, staying awake all night, then um, are we all sick or are we predisposed to certain disease? And um, if you think a little carefully, then we can relate that, yes, that may be true because if we look at the obesity and diabetes rate, that's the uh, obesity and overweight rate, um, that's directly linked to circadian disruption. It's almost three-quarter of our population now in Western world is obese or overweight. If you look at uh, 65-year-olds in the U.S. and North America, 85% of people at the age of 65 have two or more chronic disease. One third of all adults above the age of 21 have at least one chronic disease. So um, there is also epidemiological data now pointing that, well, there is this rapid rise in chronic disease in the last 50 years or 100 years, and our genes haven't changed within that time, then what might have changed? And I think circadian rhythm disruption contributes to uh, this rise. And in fact, there is now almost 2,000 different scholarly reviewed papers looking at how circadian rhythm disruption among shift workers or by simulating disruption in control clinical condition or simulating circadian rhythm disruption in animals for long-term studies leads to chronic disease, and they find that uh, there are more than 100 different diseases uh, that can arise due to circadian rhythm disruption, starting from depression, dementia, uh, depression to dementia, and even mild inflammation to cancer. Uh, so the range is pretty wide, and all of these uh, diseases are quite prevalent in modern societies. So what would, um, before the Industrial Revolution and before electricity, what would a daily routine have looked like? Well, one big thing that was um, that happened before Industrial Revolution was um, there was no cheap electrical lighting. Uh, although there was some firelight, candlelight, light was very expensive. So an average family could not afford to light up the house for more than an hour or two after uh, it became dark. So that means people had plenty of time to sleep, so they would sleep uh, at least stay in bed um, at least for eight hours consistently. And in the evening, since there was no refrigeration and no food preservation of mass, massive food production, food was not that plenty, and at the same time, people could not preserve food or store food, so all the food was most likely consumed um, maybe in one hour into darkness. So people were eating less and also eating within a um, sort of duration. Then during daytime, there was a lot of physical activity because people had to go either hunt, uh, gather, or farm, and uh, people who stayed back at home, they had to take care of the livestock or take care of the house. So there was a lot of physical activity. So now, if you think about it, there are three foundations of health, physical activity, sleep, and nutrition, and all those three are almost at the optimal level and also at the optimal timing interval. So that was one thing, one positive thing that was going for, um, for our ancestors. And Industrial Revolution did three things. One was the introduction of lighting, and we could stay awake late into the night. Second thing that happened was... Um, there was plenty of food production, food preservation, refrigeration, and methods to keep food so that we can have access to food anytime, anywhere we want. And then the third thing that happened was uh, infrastructure development, because infrastructure is essentially moving people, product, information, waste uh, from one place to another with minimal human physical activity. <laughs> and uh, when we have all these three, lighting, enough food, and infrastructure development, then we stay awake late into the night, we keep on eating as long as our eyes are open, 
and we have less physical activity during daytime. Uh, so all these three uh, now contribute to disrupting circadian rhythm and also disrupting the optimal level of sleep or activity or nutrition that we need. Okay. Um, We're going to talk more um, after the break. We are going to take a short break. We're talking today with Sachin Panda, and we're discussing his book, The Circadian Code. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Healthcare has been a major part of news stories today with one thing that has been consistent, inconsistency. Both healthcare providers and patients have to work around and get used to a constantly changing set of rules and issues. Nurses have historically been left out of this decision making. Listen to Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse, exploring the world of nursing with host Leanne Meyer. Health professionals, we invite you to share your ideas and experiences while listening to experts in various areas of nursing. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Everything is energy. It's all connected. Your energy can be seen as the foundation for your life and impacts all areas of living. Do you realize that your thoughts have the power to affect how you show up? Tune in for Healthy Energy with Margot, featuring host Margot Nielsen. Margot and her guests will show you that connecting to your energy is vital to your health, relationships, money, and more. Listen live every Monday at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Sachin Panda, and we're discussing his book, The Circadian Code. Um, So before the break, we talked about, you know, daily routines and why that's important. So I want to break that down a little bit. And one thing you talk a lot about is eating and digestion. So why, why is a schedule on that so important for our bodies? Well, just like our brain has a clock that makes us sleep, um, and during sleep, we our brain is going through reset, repair, and rejuvenation. Our digestive system also needs some downtime. And during that downtime, uh, what happens is every day our digestive system, particularly intestinal lining, uh, goes through a lot of damage. And so much damage that in every 10 to 15 days, we are replacing, literally replacing the entire lining. So that means every night, we have, uh, our body goes and finds which cells are sick or dead and replaces them. Um, nearly one-fifteenth to one-tenth of cells are replaced. So just imagine you cannot uh, repair a highway when the traffic is still flowing. Uh, so that's one big reason why uh, not eating for 12 to 14 hours at least is a good thing for your gut to repair itself and if the gut is repaired, then you don't have leakiness in your gut. So uh, allergy-causing chemicals or disease-causing bacteria cannot go from um, the inside of the gut to inside your body cavity. Second thing is um, for digestion, we, our stomach produces a lot of acid, and that acid production has a interesting circadian rhythm. So that is... Late at night, between, say, after 8 o'clock, uh, for a normal person who goes to bed around 10 or 11, around 8 o'clock, the stomach becomes super sensitive to food. So that means the same amount of food eaten during daytime, if it eaten, eaten during that late night, can produce substantially more amount of acid. And that acid 
is so much that sometimes it can come up to um, our esophagus or our mouth, uh, which is termed as acid reflux. And uh, as we, as our body prepares to sleep, our saliva production goes down, and saliva neutralizes some part of that acid. So at late night, you have this problem that as soon as you eat, some people experience this heartburn or acid reflux. That's because you're we're eating at the wrong internal clock time. Uh, then finally, another important thing is, um, just like the stomach is going into repair mode, it also doesn't allow traffic. So that means the food doesn't move down the intestine um, as quickly at night as during daytime. So your food doesn't go down, it stays there, it, you feel bloated, your repair is disturbed. So if it continues for many days or weeks, uh, together, then that causes gut problem. Uh, so that's why eating at a certain time um, or eating all your food within, say, somewhere between 8 to 12 hours gives our digestive system enough time to reset, repair, and rejuvenate. And um, actually, in the book, I explain it much more clearly with a lot of different studies showing what happens in animals or what happens among shift workers if these uh, rhythms are disrupted. So they'll find it more useful. Okay. So if we, I mean, a lot of people don't, you talk a lot about intermittent fasting um, and, and following a, a schedule with eating, which a lot of people don't do. I think people will skip meals, not on purpose. Um, or, you know, as you talk about, they'll drink coffee, which will, don't, they're not fasting when they're doing that or or they're snacking all day. Um, so can you explain why it's it's really important to have a schedule, like what that schedule, I guess, would look like with food? Yeah, so um, uh, let's start with, the, with sleep because people are very familiar with sleep. Um, so for example, uh, most sleep um, scientists um, agree that one should be, the adults should be in bed for eight hours. Uh, so if they prepare eight hours for bed, then they may get sleep somewhere between eight to seven hours. So if someone goes to bed around 10 o'clock, wakes up at six o'clock, then um, after we wake up, our melatonin level is going down. It takes a while, cortisol level is rising. So what I call the changing of the guards in our body. So when when these hormones are kind of crossing paths, uh, we know that it's not a good time to eat, so at least give yourself an hour after waking up before the first calorie. And uh, then after an hour, so after 7 o'clock uh, for this particular person, one may choose uh, to eat, say, at 7 or 8 o'clock uh, is the first uh, calorie. And then the person can choose, say, 8 hours, 10 hours, 11 or 12 hours during which... Um, all meals or all calories should be consumed. I don't go into detail about how many snacks, how many meals, or um, what size the breakfast should be, what should be the composition, but that's a good point to start um, because everybody has slightly different schedule and lifestyle is very different. Different people get different lunch break, or some don't get lunch break, etc. But what is much more important is the first calorie and the last calorie. And depending on someone's lifestyle, they can target to have, say, 10 hours is a good target because uh, even if you fall off, go to 12, you're still getting some benefit. And if you're falling off and going to 14, 15, 16 hours uh, in the weekends to entertain friends, then you can still get back on the uh, routine. And another rule of thumb is after your last calorie um, so the last calorie should be at least two to three hours before going to bed because that's, again, another changing of guard's time. When the melatonin level is rising and body is cooling down, body is preparing to go to sleep, and eating something within two to three hours before going to bed can disrupt that. And subsequently, it will lead to bad quality sleep. People may find it very difficult to fall asleep, uh, disrupt their sleep. Um, they might have um, acid reflux, etc. So eight hours in bed, leave yourself at least one hour before the first calorie, then try to target to eat all your calories within 10 hours, and then make, make sure that there is no food two to three hours before going to bed. That's kind of the bottom line. 
Okay. So when we when we don't follow this, a lot of people, you know, they'll eat right before bed or they're kind of, you know, they're not following this pattern. Um, one thing that that happens a lot, I know, is metabolic disease. Um, so is that a link that you see? And, and is that something that can be corrected if we start to follow um, this pattern that you've laid out? Yeah, so the metabolic disease um, relates to essentially how imbalance in our major macronutrients happen. So either we have too much glucose in our blood um, or too much fat in our blood and body, fatty liver disease, etc., or too much cholesterol that can uh, push us towards cardiovascular disease. And uh, again and again, there are a lot of papers, a lot of very well done scientific studies, both in animals and humans, showing that, yes, even few nights of circadian rhythm disruption, as few as four to five nights, can elevate blood glucose level. Um, so that's the... Uh, that's some of the mechanistic direct link between circadian disruption and glucose. And then when blood glucose level remains high for a prolonged period of time, then the body switches towards um, storing and saving some of that as fat. So it's also shown that some disruption can lead to increase in body mass, changes or increase in um, lipid level or fat level in the blood. And um, there is also some long-term disruption connecting to disruption in cholesterol mechanism, metabolism. Then the reverse side of the story is, um, in animals there are a lot of studies showing that if we put animals who are already sick, have obesity, um, signs of type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood lipid level, fatty liver disease, and if we put these animals in on 10 hours diet or nine hours or even up to 12 hours, then we do see this disease reverse. And in many cases, we can completely make the animals normal, healthy within a few weeks. Now, the next logical step is humans. And human studies are just coming out and we're seeing that, yes, there is reduction in body fat mass, there's better control of glucose, there's better control of fat. And um, and also there is early sign that the inflammation level goes down because inflammation, chronic inflammation is the mother of many diseases and it exacerbates metabolic disease. So um, we are seeing proof for both sides of the coin. One is disrupting circadian rhythm, increases the incidence of risk for metabolic disease. And the other side is, yes, by eating within eight to 10 or 12 hours can reverse um, many of these metabolic diseases. So, um, in 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 the you mentioned before sleep, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think that's something that people always try to cheat themselves on. Um, you know, they feel a lot of people feel there's not enough hours in the day. So, how important is that to follow a regular sleep schedule and get enough hours in? Yeah, so sleep uh, has many indirect effect on our health because a sleep deprived brain uh, is a confused brain. Uh, so it's not only con it creates confusion for your social life and taking everyday action, it also makes a bad decision about choosing food. So for example, a sleep deprived brain will tend to eat more food and more food from energy dense diet, for example, high calorie, a high fat, high sucrose, those kind of diet. So just sleeping enough um, and then the consensus is building that one should be in bed for eight hours consistently. Uh, that helps us in making many choices about our food, about our social life, about uh, when, whether we should exercise or not because a sleepy brain also uh, makes us so tired that we don't want to exercise. Second thing is how consistent it should be. Um, so in modern days, when we are not sleeping in the evening, for example, or when we are delaying our sleep time, we are just not lying down in a um, in a dark cave or dark bedroom. We are doing something else. And when you are doing something else, we are also exposed to a lot of light. So when we sleep at different time in the night, just imagine it's almost like if you're going to bed at 9 o'clock one day and then midnight the other day, although you are in the same place, in the same house, or in, maybe in the same city, your body is thinking as if you flew three time zones. So, 
accordingly your clock will try to readjust as if next day you are trying to, you will go to bed at midnight so that causes some confusion inside the body so this rhythms kind of disrupt slightly so it doesn't mean that you have to go to bed within 5 minutes uh into within the same 5 minutes window every single day but at least try to maintain a regular habit try to go to bed within the same 1 hour or 1 and 1/2 hour maximum 2 hours interval um from day to day and um another thing is um when we wake up most of us wake up with an alarm so that means although we just woke up our brain to get out of the bed our body may not be ready to go from a sleepy state to the awake state uh what i mean by that is even though we are walking we just got out of the bed a melatonin level is still high in the brain so that may reduce our performance cognition and other stuff for the first uh one or two hours after getting up it also compromises our glucose sensitivity so that means so that's why i say that after waking up uh, we should not eat so having a consistent sleep pattern sleep going to bed time giving yourself 7 to 8 hours of good sleep goes a long way not only resetting rejuvenating your brain it also has a wide spread impact on muscles and metabolism well you know and i think that's important for everybody to hear i think we we think that we can get away with a few hours even as we get older i mean it's easier when you're younger but i know a lot of people are um putting themselves in what you called sleep debt uh so that they can get through the week and try to meet all their commitments. Yeah, so a lot of us think that we can um sleep less and in fact for a long time um that's kind of the driving force for success. Um people are even looked down upon if they uh sleep a little bit more or sleep the normal 7 to 8 hours. um but that was before we knew the benefits of sleep or what harm we cause to our body by sleeping less so as i said we are just waking up to the benefits of sleep so i think uh, the societal or the personal attitude towards sleep and uh, taking pride that we can sleep less and get away with it uh, that cultural change will happen so um this is almost like going back to 70s or 60s when we just learned that smoking is bad for you and we have been saying for the last 50 years there is a big uh, societal change but it took few decades to be where we are right now and still we haven't gone over we haven't eradicated smoking uh, exactly. but there is a lot of awareness that smoking is bad so similarly i think it will take a few years for people to accept the fact that sleeping less is not a uh, badge of honor or pride. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. Um we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Sachin Panda. Um we're discussing his book The Circadian Code. We'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. Much of the time, the illnesses that people feel are simply symptoms, and they mask the root cause of what the real health problem is. You can take back control of your own health, starting with Billionaire Healthcare. This program is hosted by Ashley Black. Our program will introduce you to fascia, which is the knowledge of the living matrix. This bit of knowledge can bring you the health secrets that only the rich and famous have known until now. Listen Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Addiction can affect our relationships, our families, our home, and work lives, but most importantly, ourselves. The recovery process can do wonders in the lives of people suffering from active addiction and also for those that love them. It's not just 12-step programs, but so much more. It's learning how to live life on life's terms. If you can relate to these issues or love someone who does, start with yourself. Start by tuning in to Miracles in Recovery with host Ray Lynch, Mondays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Hope is in your corner. Have you become a member yet? Sign up now to become a member of Voice America. It's always free and easy. 
Plus, you get to take advantage of some great member benefits. Get unlimited access to millions of hours of on-demand content across all of our channels. Keep track of your favorite episodes, shows, and hosts in your own customizable library. Find out what shows you might be interested in based on your favorites. Plus, you get insider access with our newsletter. Membership gives you more. Sign up at voiceamerica.com and click register at the top right. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Sachin Panda. We're discussing his book, The Circadian Code. Um, so one thing that you brought up um, quite a, a few times, um, was, especially when we were talking about sleep, was light. And I know um, this probably, you're going to tell us, goes back to the Industrial Revolution, because now we're exposed to light all the time. Our bodies don't, you know, we're inside with the light on and the TV on, and we're not getting the darkness that we used to get. Is that affecting us on some level? Yeah, so uh, light is a very important aspect of our health, and this is, again, another aspect we are just learning recently. Um, So for a very long time, one puzzle in circadian rhythm was there are many blind people out there who can reset their clock um, perfectly fine when they fly from east coast to west coast or vice versa, Uh, and we know that for resetting our clock that strongly, light is very important. So the idea was there must be a light sensor in the eye. Um, that these blind people who cannot see can still sense light. And almost 18 years ago, um, three groups of scientists, um, including mine, simultaneously discovered the role of this blue light sensing protein called um, melanopsin. And what we um, understood was this blue light sensing protein, melanopsin, is most sensitive to blue spectrum of light, which is very rich in daylight or sunlight. And at the same time, it's less sensitive to orange light or red light that comes out of the fire. Um, So it made sense because we are designed to be in dark or maybe exposed to a little bit of fire light at night, um, which may not cause any disruption to this melanopsin. Another thing that we realized, we studied and figured out that this melanopsin sensing neurons in our eyes are directly hardwired to the master circadian clock in our brain. And I go into detail in the book how that is important or how that affects health. The bottom line is, um, yes, we are designed to see a lot of blue light or daylight during daytime, and that will synchronize our circadian clocks throughout the brain and body, and it will also reduce depression, increase alertness, and improve learning. Um, and at night time, we're designed not to see blue light. Maybe a little bit of orange light is okay. And uh, this melanopsin, if it is activated at night time with blue light, then it can go and directly shut down melatonin production, which is the sleep hormone. So now, to summarize all of this, what is happening in modern days is we stay indoor most of the time. And our indoor light level, although we can see perfectly fine inside uh, indoor, uh, indoor light level is often very low. If your windows are closed with electrical lighting, that happens for many people who are living, who are working in a uh, windowless uh, office space. They're getting maximum 200 to 300 lux of light, whereas outside in a cloudy day, even in a, in a cloudy, snowy day, uh, we have 10,000 lux of light. And so daytime, we get less light. So our circadian clocks are not synchronized. We can suffer depression. or We have less alertness. We are less excited about life. And at nighttime, we get exposed to a lot of blue light coming from screens, coming from lights, and that keeps our melatonin level low. We have difficulty falling asleep. As a result, this continuous dim light experience that we have is causing a sleepless night and foggy brain during daytime. 
So that's why it's very important to have a lot of bright light during daytime, go outside at least for 30 minutes, get some daylight. That's the best antidepressant, and it's free. You just have to step mm-hmm. outside. At the nighttime, uh, it's better to make sure that you have not too bright light at home, and if possible, install the um, all the software, so activate the softwares in your computer screen or iPhone or iPad so that the screen turns slightly orange two to three hours before your habitual bedtime. So um, it, does does this rhythm in our bodies also change with the seasons? You know, I'm, I'm in Canada and it, it's already pretty dark in the morning till later, but we all still have to get up. So does that does that affect us? Yeah, so humans actually, um, if we look at the history of humans on our planet, um, uh, only in the last 40,000, 50,000 years, humans actually went to northern latitudes like Canada or Nordic countries and lived there. And even in winter time, we know that um, there is an increase in depression rate in these northern latitude countries. Uh, because there is less light, it disrupts our circadian rhythm. There's not enough light during daytime because it's so cold to go outside. People stay indoor, uh, so that disrupts these rhythms. But irrespective of the seasonal changes, if we now that we know the importance of light, at least we can make an attempt to get ourselves at least 30 minutes to one hour of bright light by even having um, maybe lunch next to a window or staying in a sunroom um, for 30 minutes to an hour during winter time. Uh, even in the winter time, sticking to this 10 hours or 12 hours maximum eating time will at least help synchronize and keep in synchrony half of our, all the metabolic clocks um, will help. So, yes, the bottom line is these seasonal changes do affect our body rhythms, but knowing about what can help us to be in sync will give us the right tools to avoid depression, to avoid metabolic disease uh, when we live in this extreme seasonal changes. Um, that sounds like good advice for, for those of us in the north. Um, you know, the seasonal affective disorder is quite common here. Um, so knowing that we can have a little more control over it is is pretty helpful. Um, so I'm wondering, um, one thing you talk about in your book is the uh, immune system. So um, how is that affected by this rhythm? So the immune cells um, have also circadian clock, and there are three aspects of immune systems. I go deep into this in a um, couple of chapters in, in my book. One is the body's barrier function is circadian, so that means, um, as I said, our skin epithelium or skin lining and our gut lining repairs itself. So by having a strong circadian rhythm or having a strong repair, at least helps us to have a strong barrier so that uh, disease-causing bacteria um, cannot, or allergy-causing chemicals cannot get easy entry into our body. So that's the first barrier that's affected by modulated by circadian rhythm. Second is once um, our body sees a foreign agent uh, or a pathogen, then um, it also has to mount a response, immune response. And um, after the, after the um, uh, threat or the pathogen has been neutralized, it has to also calm down. Uh, so what happens it is in many cases, um, the immune system may not correctly know when to calm down. So the circadian clock has an interesting um, role in this. So every day it has it sends a signal that, okay, so it's time for you to calm down and go back, maybe reset, repair, rejuvenate your, immune, your own cells so that next day you can mount a better response. So when our circadian rhythm is disrupted, then two things happen. One, our barrier is, uh, barrier integrity is gone. So um, there is more pathogen, more allergy-causing chemicals that enter our body. The immune system gets too exhausted because it's always fighting. And the third thing that happens is it doesn't get that signal when to slow down. So in that way, what we call chronic inflammation can continue. And if it continues for a long period of time, uh, then that can lead to many different diseases and even cancer because in some cases, for example, 
in colon or in our dig- digestive system, um, people have shown that chronic inflammation um, is directly linked to some kind of tumors and also cancer. So in that way, circadian clock uh, disruption causes this chronic inflammation and can cause cancer. And having a strong circadian rhythm will help in every step in keeping inflammation in control and mounting the right response for the right period of time. Well, um, you know, it sounds like the the first step somebody should do if they're starting to experience illness or they have a chronic illness is actually look at the patterns that they have in their body and in their life and, and what what they're doing and just even changing a few things might change dramatically how they feel. Yeah, so that's uh, exactly what we see. And uh, this is also something uh, that has been proven many times in animal and human studies. Um, another thing that I wanted to add is uh, we are finding uh, this leads us to the next step. So that is for many um, diseases of inflammation or even not inflammation, we take a lot of medications. And we're finding that almost every medication also has a the right time, when the medication is taken at the right time, then it does wonder, it does what it is supposed to do, and when it's taken at the wrong time, then the medication can have adverse side effect. So a potion can become a toxin, <laughs> literally, by mm-hmm. if it is taken at the wrong time. Uh, but that's a very new area. That area is just emerging in the last five to six years. It may take another decade or two decades to mature so that we know what time we should take our medication. Um, but the bottom line is, yes, when you are sick, it's much more important to make sure that you are getting the right sleep and uh, right nutrition and at the right time. So how did, can somebody figure out if their circadian rhythm needs some work? What would be some signs? So in the book, uh, I, uh, I have one chapter how to monitor a few signs, means there is no blood test right now that's easily available. Um, but as our behavior as a daily lifestyle is a good indicator and also predictor of how our circadian rhythm is. If we monitor what, when, and how much we eat, sleep, and move, um, or at least when we eat, when we sleep, uh, then that gives us a good idea how our internal clock is. In the book, there is a table where people can fill out and, and there is a way to interpret that table that's there, or, um, or in addition to that, they can also participate in an uh, IRB-approved um, study that we have where people can go to the website called mycircadianclock.org. And mycircadian clock is one word. Anyone from anywhere in the world can sign up, go to the website, sign up for the study, and then activate the app uh, on an Android phone or an Apple phone, and then monitor uh, what, when, and how much they're eating or sleeping by simple instruction in the app itself. And then um, after they figure out what they're doing, the app also gives a uh, lot of suggestions, a lot of tips about circadian rhythm on a daily basis. Then they can decide whether they want to do a 10 hours, 11, 12, or 8 hours eating window for the next 10 to 12 weeks. They can do that self-experimentation on themselves and see what improvement they're seeing. Uh, the idea is when more and more people participate in our study and share our, their data with us, then we have a much better understanding of how people can adapt a better circadian rhythm and how adopting a better circadian rhythm helps them to manage or prevent or reverse some of this disease. And once we have those insights, we will analyze the data and publish it in peer-reviewed public journals and more and more people can understand the impact of uh, having a good circadian rhythm on their health. Um, Well, that... It, that sounds very helpful. I'm glad that you have that available because I feel like that's something everybody should do just to make sure even if they are well and don't have any diseases even at this point um, to prevent those from happening. As we learned today, there's uh, so much at stake by not following this rhythm that our bodies need so badly. Yeah, so one thing is we always feel that if it is common, then it must be normal. One simple example is many people think that it's uh, 
common that a lot of people wake up in the middle of the night once or twice and they don't have a good night's sleep. They think that as we get older, in the you know, middle age, it's common, so it must be normal. Second thing is people think that a lot of people have a bloated stomach or acid reflux, uh, nausea, etc. And they think it's so common that it must be normal. Uh, and they think that they are healthy. But actually, what we find is when they go through this time-restricted eating, or TRE, for 10 hours, or 11, 12, or even 8 hours, then they realize that how much more energy they have during the day, uh, how better they're sleeping at night, then they realize that, okay, so <laughs> what I was living was not right, not optimal. And a lot of them, within just four to five weeks, they figure out that, well, their acid reflux or hard one has completely disappeared, or it has improved a lot. So then they realize that, okay, so this is really healthy way to live. And within six to seven weeks, even the middle-aged people, like, for example, even I had some joint problems, sorry, joint pain, mild joint pain, and um, I could not run too much. And then after a few weeks of doing this, um, a few years ago, my joint pains completely disappeared. And now I can walk much faster, run, do more, much more exercise. So what well, I say is it's almost like flying economy for a very long time. And then one day you turn left and go to business class and you know what you were missing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, that, that's um, I, I loved this show and I loved sharing this information. I actually really enjoyed reading your your book. Um, if people want more information, how can they get a hold of your book or, or find you? Uh, so for the book, they can go to any online uh, bookstore, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Border, etc. They all carry it. And if you have some questions, you can also go to the, there is a website, circadiancode.com. And that has links to different um, uh, booksellers that uh, sell this, carry this book. Um, and as I said, mycircadianclock.org, that's the website that has a lot more information about our study and mostly human studies. Uh, people can sign up anywhere from anywhere any, uh, in the world. They can sign up. And this, since this is a scientific study, we respect people's privacy. No data will be shared with any commercial entity. There will be no advertisement. Um, then I am also on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is uh, Sachin Panda. They can follow me, and um, very often I put out the recent research on circadian rhythm and how it is. It has some impact on health or understanding the mechanism of circadian rhythm. Well, that that's perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. And I want to thank um, everybody for listening. If you want more information about my health journey, you can go to my blog site at dr-risk.com or follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks so much for listening and be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.